A real secret, and I wish some of the college teams were here, ask people who've done it before what works and what doesn't, and, that, and that's how you build a successful human-powered airplane the first time instead of making some grievous error. Uh, so we really wanted to fly at Half Moon Bay. It's under transition from NASA to Google, who's managing it. Fortunately, Google was one of our sponsors, and they decided they wanted to sign on as a visible sponsor, and so then that helped us get approval to fly there. And we'll, we'll go talk about that in a bit. But one of the key things about Moffett is it's almost dead flat. It's, it's maybe a third of the grade here, so maybe 10, 15 watts difference in, in one direction or the other. Uh, okay, next thing to show. Okay, so we had several successful flights, including our first female, fe female pilot of Dash, six total flights, five pilots. It was a perfect day. Uh, we're running out of time because it's a one runway airport and they have a NOTAM closing the whole airport down for us. And um, so we were close to the center uh, taxiway. And so Ariel just got the chance to do a very short hop. It would have been a longer hop, but we had the same problem with the chain ring jumping off, except now instead of jumping off, or the, the chain jumping off the uh, off track, instead of jumping off the chain rings, it's jumping off the idler planes now. We moved the problem. We put these chain guides on both of the chain rings and solved that problem and moved it to the idler pulleys. And it immediately popped off when he started and he didn't want to put a bunch of power in. He's our strongest athlete. He's a Cat 1 bike racer, one level below pro. Should be able to fly this thing for ages. But he got to do this teeny little hop. But I want to you to see the end here because it's a little bit reminiscent of what happened earlier today. But we got lucky. So we're learning that we want to avoid going off the runway and also that we want to have the wing catchers really catch uh, the wings. We had a lot of problems with this the next time. Um, so what's next? How are we doing? Pretty good. So some photos of that weekend. That's Ginger Croft, our first female pilot. We have two other female pilots who haven't had a chance to fly yet. Uh, one of the things we're really interested in, if, if we find that the power is low enough as we think it can be or will be, maybe by putting the 40 meter wings on or by cleaning up some of the other drag items, uh, I think one of the first things we're going to do is try to go up over after some of the female records, which are quite achievable and logistically easier to do than the, you know, the Grand Poobah 115 kilometer flight. <coughs> this is Greg Thomas, the guy who was in the flipped upside down Voltaire. You'll be seeing him again later. So some of the problems we had when we first came out, um, the control rod pulled out. It had this little glued joint there that didn't work very well so we fixed it in the field um these these are the uh well view the top solution for f preventing it from hopping off the chain ring this is a 3d printed chain guard that goes on both sides it basically creates a channel so it doesn't try to hop out and this is also showing the uh our home built hall effect sensor you can see the little magnet right there um, that was giving weird results so to fix that, we got one of these weather meters with Bluetooth that beams down to our phone here, but it's way up at the top of the king post, and the problem is it has an auto shut off. So we get it all set up and ready to go, and then it auto shut off when we had to switch into a different um, screen on our avionics software. So the second day, we managed to keep it on for a few of the flights and got some good airspeed data, nice, smooth, reliable, reasonable airspeed data. But we need to figure out a better place for this that we can actually re to reset it. And we also have to figure out a way to get the avionics to not be as flaky as it is. This is uh, jury rigging the, the um, basically these are tied around and then tied to the fitting on the top that the king post wires fit to. It didn't work very well because it still sagged quite a bit. Um, so we ended up fixing this before our June flights by directly lashing a metal ring on instead of having a wire coming out, which fatigued and bent. 
This is another interesting failure we had. Um, after my first flight, remember I landed sort of sideways? The reason I showed you that flight was that's this, this is a very lightweight blow molded plastic trash can wheel. Um, and it, I think, scraped off <laughs> the part of the wheel on that landing. And then my next takeoff on the second flight, which I didn't show, was a much longer takeoff. I had a little bit longer flight, but I was really exhausted by the takeoff. I couldn't real figure out why. And Greg's first flight the next day was the same thing, really long takeoff. But we were hearing this click, 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 click. I thought it was the screwed up idler pulley, but then when we inspected it later, we had this another view with the wheel removed. Basically about a third of the tread, if, if you want to call it that, was gone. We had a lot of these wheels, so we were able to replace it in less than five minutes. Um, but we found later at, at, at um, Moffett Field that we had this exact same failure. We don't know if it happened on the previous flight or just in rolling the plane out. Um, this is a little bit hard to see, but I'll, this, this one's better to see. The problem we're having here is this one's still on the teeth. This one is completely hopped off the teeth and sitting on this hardwood washer that's in between the idler and these brackets. Um, half of the flights that we had on the successful day were flown with the chain off and just <laughs> rubbing against this piece of wood. Um, I don't know how much of a drag penalty or, or you know power penalty we were paying for that. So uh, some, slack side. huh? It's a slack side. Yeah, it's a slack side, so it may not be that bad. Um, so some lessons from these flights: we did some field fixes which worked. Oh, an interesting problem we had was the LCD on the uh, screen of the RC system went completely blank in the cold. We decided to go ahead with the flights because we could see that <coughs> uh, it was still the neutrals were correct and it was still controlling correctly. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> but um, <coughs> we thought it was probably because it was cold and sure enough over the course of the day it heated up. So we came up with a fix of using these these instant heating pads and some towels the next day and that worked really well. We need a better idler pulley. Talked about that. Landing gear. Talked about that. King post. Talked about that. I showed you earlier a picture where the javelin man isn't really doing much for us because we're up at two meters plus and you just can't get very much um, force, but we found that we don't really need to. The unassisted takeoffs work just fine. Dew was a really big problem back in February and we've seen that here a little bit. We really don't, you know, there's a weight issue and probably more importantly an aerodynamic issue and we really don't know how much that's costing us, but the first day after I flew the two times I took the tail surface off and water was just dripping off of it. Um, and the wing, the top of the wing surfaces were the same. So. Um, <clears throat> trying to figure out how to control that or pick the right weather conditions flying in is something that's important. We fixed the first power meter and just in case we put some of those pedal based power meters on. So now we have two working power meters and I'll show some data in a little bit from the last set of tests. The, the PIO issue was fixed by speeding up the tail about three times. And we still have issues with the airspeed sensor. I talked about uphill versus downhill. So last test flight weekend, we're almost done with this and then we can do questions. Uh, we went to Moffett Federal Airfield. I'll show some pictures and maps in a minute. Much bigger, 20 minutes from our shop. Very convenient, um, proved to be convenient the very first day. Uh, and really wide, 200 foot wide, World War II era runways, really long. Um, we put channel type pulleys on this time. And we had a new problem pop up, which is the caster, uh, front caster bearing on the front wheel kept popping bearings out, which hadn't happened on our previous what, nine flights. But we got five flights in with four pilots over two days, including a 1.3 plus kilometer flight in the uphill direction, although not very uphill, it's pretty flat. And the, but the last flight ended in a crash, which I'll show you a video of. And we're using the opportunity of the broken um, front wheel and the crunched front fairing to make a better front fairing with tighter, hopefully lower drag, smoother, and a better system for our front wheel. Uh, this is the Moffett Federal Airfield. This is the long runway and then the slightly shorter runway. We got to use the slightly shorter runway. Um, we could have flown, you know, well into the early afternoon if we wanted to, um, but the wind picks up. So we set it to stop at noon and practice. I think we stopped by 10 or 1030. Um, this is uh, just another view of that. So we're operating on three, two left, one, four right. So videos. Okay, the really cool thing, I don't know how many of you guys 
have had a chance to see this. I sent the link out a few days ago. But you have to check this out. It's really fun. Um, little golf ball sized camera that got mounted up a little bit above the pilot has four lenses in it and it puts them all together to make a seamless 360 view. You can use virtual reality glasses like th this with your phone to see it and I brought my phone and I brought this if anybody wants to try it then it's really cool you can sort of spin around and look up and see it but you can also look at it in a browser or just on your phone without the VR stuff and the neat thing is when you play it you basically can look at live video playing in any direction so we can one problem was it created a bunch of little files that had to get spliced together and the splice job wasn't perfect so you see that the wingman just disappears all of a sudden but you can see that I'm in the air you can go back and look at me huffing and puffing and grimacing you can see what a pilot's eye view is you can inspect the uh, you know what's going on with the wing in any or the propeller or the drivetrain in any position it's it's really a lot of fun and um, we have this for the the three flights on Saturday we had the camera on Saturday so I sent a link in that email I sent a little while back if anybody didn't get it I'll leave my cards here and you can pick up my card just send me an email I'll send you the link um, but you can look at all three flights in this 3d view um, now I'm going to show that same flight but from an external camera so we were going to take bets on how much I was going to fly how, how far I was going to fly given that I'm heavier than I should be and not in great shape um, since I've been able to do 33 back in December I thought maybe I'd go farther maybe I'd make 500 meters I, in the end I ended up doing actually 636 meters on this flight I intentionally got a lot higher so that there was less chance of just a, an accidental landing and what I found is about two-thirds of the way through I got pretty exhausted. You'll actually see in that 360 video, I'm talking about it and saying, okay, I'm ready to land. Oh wait, maybe not yet. Um, because it got easier. I don't know if it was ground effect. I don't know if I trimmed it back a little bit or what happened, but you'll see later when I show the power meter results that my power was tapering off, but I was still flying and staying, you know, I wasn't getting any lower once I got, I got sort of lower in the second half of the flight. A little bit of you know pitch oscillation again I'm not letting it trim itself and we'll see that pitch is a problem later with the crash so we're gonna try to rework our stick to be much stiffer in pitch and try to do most pitch inputs with trim try to get it trimmed out for every pilot so here's where I'm getting a little bit lower and thinking about quitting but then the thing just keeps going and going and going again I'm not the athlete that's gonna fly this long time I'm supposed to be able to fly for a couple minutes or five minutes depending on how light I am and how good of shape I'm in um, all right I'm gonna stop before oh, let me let's see might have we, we had problems we had a left crosswind all day on Saturday until Craig flew the other direction and then it came from the left again but you know the other direction because he's going the other direction on the runway so we had our first problems with ground loops and getting damage from ground loops and not quite knowing how the wing wing walkers and wing catchers are supposed to deal with um, catching the wing and is it better to have it go off the runway or is it better to have the wing scrape or you know ha what thing are you trying to protect <clears throat> this whole day we kept having the ball bearings pop out of the uh, our poor design for a wheel bearing I'm going to show a very brief part of this Jeff's slightly longer flight than mine and I had noticed that that bearing was a little loose. It probably lost some ball bearings in that, that sh uh, crash I showed you from Half Moon Bay. Not crash, but hard landing or hard roll off, whatever you want to call it, where the plane kind of went up a little bit. Um, but I had a nice smooth landing on my flight on, on the main gear. Here it's, it's subtle, but if you watch, he lands slightly on the nose first. And so I think some more balls popped out there when he landed. And then what that did was in the next flight we, we flipped the airplane around and went the other direction and this is Craig's first attempt and he made it precisely about six inches down the runway and the whole bearing failed and the front wheel fell off so 
the one spare part that we didn't bring was more of those turntable bearings. But now we were only 20 minutes away, so we rushed down, found a couple more of them in the shop, brought them back and fixed it. And then Craig was able to do a 1.3 plus kilometer flight. We had some problem with our avionics, so we don't have an exact GPS distance, but I used the markings on the runway and Google Maps to estimate um, his distance. <coughs> The thing I want to show here, I wish I had the, a view directly from behind, so it's a little bit harder to see with the distorted camera, but in, in a little bit here, he gets quite low on the right wing, sort of reminiscent of what happened to Airglow earlier. But I'm yelling at him on the radio, left, 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 left. And finally he put left input in and he recovered. Uh, it was the hour wait between um, getting the turntable and fixing that bearing, the wind was getting much sportier. And so he really got hit by some gusts here and He's not a pilot. He's here, yeah, here's, here's where he's going over and then he finally recovers. Um, he's sort of a, a natural pilot, but he's not a pilot. So um, it's, it's been actually pretty amazing. All these non-pilot athletes that we've done a little bit of training with have flown the airplane pretty well with a little bit of coaching on the radio. I'm gonna skip forward to near the landing. Oh, well, I guess I just skipped forward to pass the landing. The, uh, he was trying to get all the way to the end of the runway, but he started getting hit with more turbulence, and you'll see this in the power meter results in a little bit. And so he ended up just having to land early. And this is interesting because, again, we ran into this dilemma of he's dealing with the crosswind. You'll see he lands with the wing already a little bit over, and then he has to put in left rudder to prevent the wing tip from hitting, but of course that points him towards the left side of the runway. We're still using this weak turntable bearing, and so he ends up heading off the runway, and as soon as he hits the end and hits a little rock, boom, all the bearings spill out, and we broke it again. I guess you won't, maybe you'll see it in this weird sideways view. <laughs> I love those abstract endings with this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so boom, right there, he hits the thing, and that popped out a couple of the bearings, but it, it did enough damage that we had to, again, change it. We decided the air was too, too bumpy, we're quitting for the day, we changed it out and got it ready for the next day. Okay, we're almost to the end here. Um, so now we're gonna see, so Greg had one short flight the next day where he landed unexpectedly and decided to stop. Again, we didn't know what to do with the wing handling and it was this fight between do we let it ground loop or do we let it go off and it eventually went off the runway and again damaged the bearing. We're out of bearings, but we bought a spare different kind of caster wheel and fixed it. And let's see here. Okay. So his second flight of the day with a different caster wheel, we did a really great job of getting this new setup going so we could keep flying. He had some problems. This is the same Greg that flipped Voltaire, which wasn't his fault, and who's had three other successful flights. But we had a pretty light spring force on the joystick, and he went over to the left a bunch, corrected to the right, overcorrected to the right. You see he dips down there a little bit, and then he overcorrects to the left, and then he basically flew it right into the ground without realizing it. We thought, it, we, we were in the car right back here, Linda and I, and we're like, what happened? And then he came on the radio and said, what happened? <laughs> um, and we weren't sure for so it didn't look like a stall. We th I thought, did the RC system lock up and it locked him in some, you know, some position? But one thing to note right here, look at this weird way that he's, he's basically trying to steady himself with two of his fingers on the handlebar while the rest of it is on the joystick, which you can't see, it's up above there. He got poked by a little piece of carbon fiber that was exposed, and so he put some more tape over, but he modified his grip too. And I think what happened is by having the two fingers up there, he limited the travel that he could do on the rest of the joystick. He wasn't free to move the joystick. And so while he was dealing with this, moving this way and moving that way, he was inadvertently putting down elevator into the system. Um, I think I'm gonna skip forward, there's nothing much interesting about this to the next view which really shows what happens. So keep an eye on the elevator.
So you see where he started right of this center line and now he's drifting way far left. He corrects, kind of overcorrects, comes back, does a little dip down. But let's watch it again. Down, let's see. Right, down elevator, down elevator, down elevator, down elevator, down elevator. He never pulled back on the stick. And an interesting thing, watch it one more time. He had been doing subtle pitch changes by changing the power because he noticed when he put more power in, it would pitch up. So when he realized that he was going down, watch his pedaling cadence. He pedals harder into the ground, but of course that's not, he has a lot of down elevator in there and inadvertently doesn't realize it. So what we're going to try to do is um, add some extra springs in, in that direction or maybe find a different joystick where it has two separate springs that we can have differentially so that it's a lot easier to do the lateral than the, the pitch input. Um, that's it on the videos, I think, but uh, we have a couple more slides and then we can do questions. So just, this is a panorama of the setup. This is the wheel, it's 175 grams heavier all up with the bearings not shown versus that lightweight, whoops, that lightweight um, garbage can wheel, blow molded wheel, but it's got a rubber tread and it's proving much more reliable. This is in place, it again only took about five minutes to change out. I really like this sort of backlit photo. This is from my first flight at Moffitt, first and only flight. We intentionally got a, a lot higher this time, trying to get up two or three meters. So you can see Craig got up there pretty far. Almost every flight we had a problem with this front wheel bearing, so I'm not so sad that the thing snapped off because now it gives us an opportunity to rebuild it. And another lesson we learned is there was rough pavement and the javelin man stumbled and hit his hand and actually got some pretty bad cuts. We're also worried about if people try to hold on to the lift wire or we're gonna get a thinner um, cord for holding the middle of the wing. We just want people's hands to be protected. So we're gonna require all the wing runners, wing catchers to wear gloves now. Um, and we're also from the breaking of fibers and stuff um, I think we're going to have wing runners, wing catchers, and the pilot wear some sort of eye protection too. This is an example of some of the damage that happened from the several mild wing, uh, ground loops that we had. There was some minor damage to the tips, um, the first few ribs on the tips, not that bad. But the biggest damage was right in the middle of the wing. I don't know if you guys have, have seen the same thing. But um, right in the middle of the wing, near where the, the lift wire attaches, we had several ribs that were quite badly broken. You know, there's so many ribs on this wing that, we, that we're sort of intentionally holding this out of shape to look at it. But it sort of springs back and kind of holds its shape. And we were able to fly with that for a few more flights. But after we got back to the shop, we fixed that damage. This shows you what happened. <clears throat> We'd always intended to have a molded bottom like Airglow AeroCycle have. AeroCycle have but we just ran out of time. So we built this thing with, with lightweight balsa and carbon fiber formers, um, kind of similar to what David did on Betterfly, but with a little bit of very lightweight carbon fiber. And then we used Depron on the sides, but it made a really bumpy nose and it was actually wider than it needed to be. So to back to, we've actually repaired all this already, the frame part of it anyway, back to about here, we're here backwards, we're just gonna keep the same Depron, but from here forwards, en encompassing all of this, we're now gonna make a proper molded piece uh, that's gonna be narrower, so it's gonna decrease the drag, and it's gonna be smoother, which should help a little bit in de decreasing the drag. We, hit, we struck one prop, it stopped very abruptly. Um, the damage is not as bad as it looks, it just delaminated a little bit. We're gonna squeeze some epoxy in there. The, the actual carbon fiber piece in there is undamaged and intact. And as soon as we took the load off it, it sprung right back into shape. Uh, this aluminum seat frame, sorry, aluminum seat frame uh, <laughs> was fine, but the, um, 
uh, the, the mesh here obviously took a little bit of the force for Greg. Greg was completely unharmed in the, in the crash, which was the most important thing. Um, and uh, so we're just getting that repaired. And then this is a pretty good view of, we have this strong box that we built up with um, carbon fiber um, hex sandwich material for the um, bottom bracket. And this chain tube is, a, is, we call it the chain tube because it's taking the force from the chain, but then it extends below and that's what was holding our, our front castering wheel system. And that broke off right at the stronger bit with the um, bottom bracket box. So we're just going to get rid of all of that, have a sleeved part that goes inside here, and then an aluminum um, piece that goes inside of that with a couple bushings that can take more side force. There's very little load on this under normal conditions. It's only when you hit these rocks. And then we're going to, maybe for record flights, we'll keep the really lightweight. This is not the really lightweight piece. This is the, the temporary kludge. But we have a really lightweight three inch walker wheel that we had been using. And we might put that back on, but we're going to go to a 110 millimeter inline skate wheel so that we'll have a little bit better chance of rolling on over some of these rocks if we do go off, off piste. Um, and then this was just some damage just from the ha ground handling of the airplane to the bottom of the um, vertical tail. We don't, we've never hit the vertical tail during flight or anything like that. The last slides I'm going to show, these are from the th those three flights on Saturday in Half Moon Bay, my flight of 636 meter. Jeff's of 700 plus and Craig's of 1.3 kilometers. You can see, this is me, this is a little hard to see, but this is uh, 246, 800 watts. So I peaked at about 800 watts. This is the takeoff. I'm definitely in anaerobic zone here, which I expect for me. Um, but the interesting thing is that this is about, about here where I'm now getting you know 350 down to 300, below 300 watts. I'm still flying this whole time until probably around here somewhere when the power is really low. Um, so I'm not quite sure what was happening there and why I was able to fly under so much less power than before. But I was still properly exhausted and couldn't have gone much longer. Jeff had a longer takeoff run for some reason and so burned up a lot of his power. And then he sort of had these two different regions. This little region right here where he's averaging about 400 watts and then the rest of this where he's averaging about uh, 300 watts. Um, 300 watts for him is still a little bit high. He's not going to be able to sustain that for very long. Um, this is GPS speed, not that we, we didn't record any speed data because we're still having problems with airspeed data because we're having problems with the airspeed system. This is cadence. He had a very nice smooth cadence. He looked very, if you watch him in the 360 video, if you go to that link later, he looked very relaxed while he was flying, even though he told us later that he was really exhausted by the end. And then this is uh, the sportier air and after an hour of fixing the caster system when Craig flew. This is, this is takeoff and then this is when he was dealing with that thing where he, he got hit by the gust and his wing was to the right. And then this is near the end where he got hit by another gust. But if you ignore those bits, this is averaging about 300 watts, which for him he can sustain for long periods of time. So I'm, even though it's higher than predicted, like it should be at 270 or something for him, we've got several areas of drag reduction, including the narrowing of the fuselage that I'm, I think is gonna help with that. Um, and I'm, I'm encouraged that we're in the right ballpark for being able to make really long flights. You know, we made this, this project's already a complete success because the, the fun of it was designing and building it and just flying it. That was, that was considered a success. But I think that the plane is, you know, possibly going to be able to perform some pretty long flights. And so um, I'm, I'm encouraged by these very preliminary results. And I'd hope to do a bunch more tests last weekend before we came, but we can't because the plane's broken right now but we'll do a lot more tests and start really analyzing the power data that comes out of it and try to get it as low as we can get it and then eventually head out to the desert and, and uh, try to do some really long flights, probably starting first with seeing if we can break the female, female records, which I think are about 30 minutes and about 10 kilometers. But there's one, there's one of the female record distance records that's only 10 kilometers, which should be not trivial to break, but it should be achievable. And we have, you know, we've had one female pilot fly so far, but um, one that hasn't is like one of the top college um, athletes. I mean, she's better than Craig. When I, we, I looked at her, her power data for a bunch of hill climbs and she's, um, she's really, really elite. Um, so I think there's a good chance that we're gonna be able to, uh, to do it. If she hasn't flown yet, so who knows if she's gonna be a natural pilot or not. She has done some of the training, 
um, but it should be good. Uh, I think, oh, lessons, and then we'll go to questions. Um, so we really need to get a better wing catching procedure. We've talked about that. Safety gloves, fixing the bearing, fixing the airspeed thing. We had a spectator, we had to deal with spectators. They, they had a limited number of people, crew, that could be out on the airfield because the, it was an open airfield with an active other runway. So we had people that wanted to watch. One of the spectators later when we were finished came back and helped us by jamming one of our wing sections into the wrong shelf <laughs> uh, in our trailer. We were able to extricate it with just a little bit of mylar damage. Um, and, th and then as far as the crash goes, we talked about having less sensitive in pitch, trying to do fly mostly with trim except for, you know, the takeoff and landing flare and any gust, dealing with any gusts. And we want to do a lot more pilot training about, you know, where's the light, right, right place to be looking and what's the right reactions to do in, in certain s sort of situations. So how did I do? It is 5.15, just about what we th said it would be. Well, why don't we just have a few minutes of questions and then we need to roll into the briefing. Any other questions that haven't already been asked? Nobody wants to ask any questions. Oh, okay, the power um, uh, measurement. Yes. Uh, yes. It, it, uh, if you do a really bit of constant torque paddling, uh, you'll get lower power required. Yeah? So maybe your uh, you know, your const constancy of torque improved. Could be. Yeah, I mean, it could be that I just sort of relaxed, and I, it, it could be that I was flying faster, and Maybe. since we don't have airspeed, good airspeed data, we can't really tell. We only have the GPS speed data. Um, it could be that I trim slower. It could be that there is some ground effect that's taking effect because I was a little lower in that second part of the flight. I'm not sure what it is. And anyway, I think we need to do more, more testing to find out. The, the thing, none of us in the 14 flights we've had so far have been able to even touch our trim buttons because we've just been too busy. And so I really want to get it set up so that in pitch at least we're, dealing, we're, we're properly trimming it out for people and we investigate the speeds for the, the lowest power. So is your pilot position significant from the center of gravity that you're to compensate? Um, I mean, it goes in the right direction as people get lighter and shorter to help compensate a little bit, but it doesn't perfectly compensate. So we're, keeping, we're, we're going to do a better job from now on of keeping track of exactly where the seat is and what the trim position is on the RC system and physically on the elevator for, the, um, for each pilot. So my goal is, you know, over the next few sets of tex test weekends with flying with each pilot is find a comfortable trim position for each one of them and nail that down so that when we change the seat position, we can we can get them right in the right spot. Because we've had, we have you know, people that are like this tall flying it and people that are this tall flying it. I'm, I'm sort of in the middle um, and weights varying anywhere from 115 pounds to 200 pounds. So it's quite a range of, of um, people, leg length and, and weights that we're, we're flying in the plane. Is there a feedback for your control system? Is it what? On the control system, uh, is there any feedback as well? No, no. I mean, we went with an RC system um, just because I thought a mechanical system was going to be a lot more difficult and may maybe not as reliable. And, you know, if you do it right, like Daedalus was able to do it and set up the, the thing right, you can actually get real force feedback from the control surfaces themselves. But we're just relying on the spring forces. And our spring force frankly, is too light right now. Um, so that's, that's one of the problems. You know, he just wasn't aware. He probably wasn't looking at the horizon because he was concentrating on the, the lateral. He was having quite a bit of lateral swing back and forth. And so he didn't notice that, his, that he inadvertently put some pitch in. On the pilot training idea, yes. uh, I noticed that one of the balls falling uh, the air came down the runway with a chase car and dribbling from the back. And I noticed that once, once or twice where there was a lot of gusty the situation of side winds, that when we were falling and actually videoing all the, all the time, it was possible to use that video, I think so, to actually train pilots because they can see every movement and, and the attitude of the air. Yeah, we're definitely, some of the video that we took from our own flights and then some of the video we've taken here we're going to use um, to sort of set up situations 
And then we're actually, we have, I don't know if you saw in that video of the plane before I started talking, but we have this sort of wooden test rig with propellers that we can use. We're gonna set up our flight simulator that we already have with the real stick, with the, the new spring tension in it, <clears throat> and have them fly, in, and you can set up flight gear to have different levels of, of turbulence and stuff that disturbs things, and have them fly um, that simulator while they're actually pedaling pedals producing power and stuff. So um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna be much more extensive with the pilot training than we were before to try to, try to help a lot of that stuff. Pilots Park, are you able to say um, roughly how big your team is now? In some practical terms, for doing all this work. We've had over 200 people that have worked one day or more on the plane, but it's in terms of building, it's been a core of a dozen to maybe 20 people, and that's changed over the years as people have you know, moved in and out of the area and interest has waxed and waned. There's probably a, a core of a, a real core of like maybe eight or ten people that do a lot of the building and a lot of the helping when we do this kind of stuff. But we actually had, I think the crew was, I don't know, close to 20 people the first day at Moffett Field and maybe like 15 people the second day. They're not all involved in the actual putting together the airplane and we, we carefully assign crews to do th stuff and like I said because we have to put everything together we, we don't have a hangar at Moffat we have to put it all together from scratch each day we we assign tasks and we try to do things in parallel to save time um, but uh, you know we'd like to be able to get down to even smaller skeleton crew than that but that then that might slow us down a little bit so but you must have a bit of time encouraging that number of people to yeah um, yeah, it doesn't just happen. <laughs> you know, it's it's been kind of a fun project, and people can kind of come and go as they they want. But the people who are really interested in it, you know, both the building and the the flying, um, have stayed pretty committed. One thing that really, I mean, the people who are the most committed now are the pilots. Yeah. And the good thing about having we have now, like, we've had six people fly it already, and we have two more, maybe three more people that are going to fly it, and so. If all the pilots show up, and me and Linda and a couple other people, we have enough crew to do it. I mean, to 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 fully do it on on the tarmac, we need about seven people minimum, um, the way that we're running it right now, anyway. And to, it's good to have a few more people than that for putting the plane together. Um, and if you have five pilots that might fly, you almost have that contingent to begin with. Um, so that's one. It, advantage of having a lot of pilots, but if you have a lot of pilots, then each one of them only gets a limited amount of flying time. And um, I think we're gonna get to the point if we start actually trying to go for some longer flights and records where we're gonna have to winnow that out and it's only gonna be a few pilots, you know, a couple males and a couple females that are gonna get to fly the plane most of the time. And so I am a little bit worried about that. And, you know, it's a little bit different in your backyard in Silicon Valley going to Moffett Field versus driving four hours and staying in a hotel somewhere out in the desert for a week to try to try to set a record. So um, I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen with all that. Did you find it difficult to find space to build? Well, Google um, is now an acknowledged sponsor of the project. And for the first three and a half years of the five years, <coughs> five, five and a half years now, we basically were going from one Google building that they had acquired to another. When I started working at Google in 2003, there were 800 people in the company. When I left in 2011, there were 30,000. And so they just started building a the sort of ad hoc campus by you know, snapping up more and more buildings kind of in the same vicinity of each other. And so what would happen was they'd get a building, but they weren't ready to t you know, tear out the inside and start it over. And they'd let us use it for three months or six months. And then when they said, okay, now we have to start doing construction, we go to the next one. But what happened is they got so big and they're so short of space that eventually they told us about two years ago now, okay, we can't do this anymore. And so now I've been running a, a workshop near San Jose Airport. So that's a you know, somewhat significant p expense. I'm paying $2,500 a month for that. What does Google get out of this project? Uh, it's sort of a cool techie thing. Um, we, ha it, we have more than Google that sponsors. We have the the power meters from Quark and the cranks from Lightning and um, the Mylar was given to us by um, Aurora Flight Sciences who was made 
a company started by the people who did Daedalus, and, and there are several other sponsors, that, um, people that did machining, that did um, uh, on both the propeller and on other parts of the plane and that kind of thing. So, I you know, I don't know why do sponsors ever sponsor anything. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, not so far, and that's been in intentional. We haven't tried to put any press releases out or anything. I didn't want to do it. You know, we knew it flew after the first two times at Moffat, but I didn't want, or, or at Half Moon Bay, but I didn't want to do anything at Moffat because our main goal at Moffat this last time was to make sure that we can fly at Moffat again multiple times. Uh, they had a lot of rules there, and it was a much more difficult place to operate than Half Moon Bay. But we did a really good job. They were very happy with how it went. And so now we'll be able to fly there many times. So I didn't want to have the complication of press being there. The only actual press we've gotten is from the Half Moon Bay Journal from the first, uh, the first flight back in December. Um, but I am going to sort of seek, seek some press out now that we know that the plane flies well and um, now that we're doing it really in the heart of Silicon Valley in, in Mountain View. Did you do also the searching for sponsors yourself? Okay, let's do like one or two more questions and then we need to wrap it up. Any more questions? That's a good way to kill the questions. <laughs> All right, that's it. Oh, do you need the projector? I'll, I was about to turn it off, but I'll leave it on. Uh, yeah. Have you got internet connection on your computer? Uh, yeah. Uh,